Hello, good fry, good, good day, internet. It's Friday, which means it's time for the coding train. Here I am again. Uh, my name is Dan. Today is Friday, June second. The year is 2017, and I'm back for another weekly episode live stream of this internet YouTube thing that I do, which is uh, something to do with coding, I hear. That's what uh, I was told as I was wandering down the hallway and, and somebody said what happens in this room where I am. Okay, so uh, I've got a bunch of things to talk about. Um, I see that the chat is going strong. Um, and lots of people saying hi and choo-choo and all sorts of other train-related greetings in a variety of languages, which is super nice. Okay, I've got some stuff to talk with everybody about today. So, I don't know if any of you were watching last week. If you weren't, that's probably for the best. But I, I, I've got a little uh, mea culpa here, which is that I attempted to, uh, you know, I'm, I've got this summer project, my summer project. I don't know how I ended up doing this, but this is my summer project, is um, to teach and create a set of video tutorials about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'm kind of on the tracks. I'm like, the train gets derailed quite often, but I, I've been making a variety of tutorials and things. And I'm right now I'm in the weeds of building up and trying to set a foundation for neural network-based machine learning. And oop, I hear people talking. Maybe they're talking about me. Um, and so uh, one of the things, if, uh, I, I suppose I'm just going to, let's, let's have some uh, resources here to talk about. I'm going to go to uh, this uh, YouTube channel thing. Um, and um, you can see that most recently, uh, right now I'm in uh, session three. So I'm trying to make a set of videos for a course. Um, and I'm not really kind of doing them haphazardly over time in an arbitrary schedule. But um, uh, I'm looking at the chat now. Um, and I'm on session three. So let me, let me I'm gonna get myself centered here. Uh, if I go to the syllabus, uh, session one was all about um, algorithms and search and graph systems. And I have a variety of videos that I made about binary trees and breadth first search and A star search and traveling salesperson. Uh, session two, uh, was all about genetic algorithms and I did a variety of uh, videos about kind of walking through what a genetic algorithm is and a few different scenarios and applications. And so n I'm in, still in, I'm, I'm working, I'm, week three, session three is designed to set a foundation for session four. So the idea of session three is to talk about um, mach uh, m machine learning, what machine learning is, what are typical tasks performed by machine learning, namely classification, looking at data and trying to label that data. It's hot, it's cold, it's a picture of a cat, it's a picture of a dog. There are a variety of ways you can think about labeled data, um, as well as regression, which is making a prediction based on data that has a c continuous output. So uh, regression might be, um, let me try to predict the weather based on ice cream sales. Um, or the other way around, <laughs> who knows? Uh, or you know, the classic scenario is let me try to guess, we have a machine learning algorithm predict or guess the appropriate price for a house based on the properties of that house. So this is where I've been. Okay, last week or two weeks ago or at some point, I looked at something called linear regression with gradient descent. And the idea here, oops, let me turn this camera on. The idea here is to, uh, is to look at a very simple scenario. Okay, so ultimately, ultimately, eventually, the idea of deep learning, um, the reason why machine learning based systems can be powerful and interesting and uh, experimental and playful or useful, all of these types of things, is because we might have a, some data that has many, 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 I don't even know if you could see that. Yeah, you can, all my little lines. 
uh, 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 many dimensions. So if you think about uh, a house, you know, there's the number of bedrooms and there's the number, there's the square footage and there's the zip code and there's maybe the, uh, the average temperature. There's it's something, there's, there's all sorts of, you can, you can come up with a very, 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 very long list. Let's try to think of, uh, um, and so something like um, trying to uh, learn something about an image or a piece of text. These are also high dimensional, uh, uh, examples of data with many dimensions, like an image has like all these millions of pixels in it. So how can we make sense of so, so much data? But in order to get a found, in order to, to understand how the systems work that can approximate a function that will perform a classification or regression with a lot of high dimensional data coming in, it's often easiest to start with, well, I'm just off in the weeds here, uh, it's often easiest to start with it and try to understand, well, what if there was just one data input? So the only thing is, you know, temperature. And from temperature, you can think of that as X. We're trying to predict sales Y. And so we might have a known data set, which we could plot on this graph of temperature as related to sales. And then we might be able to perform what's known as a linear regression, which is trying to fit a line, <laughs> fit a line to this data that approximates it. So that if for any given temperature, I can make a prediction as to what I think the sales would be. Okay. So this is what I've done so far. This is the case that I'm making. I want to be able to build and work with systems with high dimensional data. So it's not just the temperature I'm using to predict sales. It's so much more. It's all about the temperature and the humidity and the population of a city and the, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. That's what I'm trying to do. So, okay, coming back over to here. I see, no matter what I talk about, anytime I glance, whenever I glance at the chat, almost all the time the discussion is, I think Python is better than Java. Oh, actually, really, you should program in C++, but Lisp, Lisp is the answer to everything. But I like to program in JavaScript because it's the best language ever. That's always what the discussion is. <laughs> I was able to stop that from being the discussion when by accident I started talking about temperature in Fahrenheit, and I mentioned I really should use Celsius, and then all of a sudden the chat Fahrenheit versus Kelvin versus Celsius. Nobody was talking about which programming language is better than the other one. It was a glorious day. <laughs> okay, I've only made it worse. Okay, so now, so you can perform a linear regression using a statistical approach. So with simple data like this, and I can, can you even see that? It's very small, I'm gonna have to write bigger make larger drawings. You can perform a linear regression with simple data like this, just using a statistical approach. So there's a formula to actually figure out where that line goes precisely. But if we're looking to make this prediction in this impossible to visualize or parse or understand high dimensional space with a lot more than just a single piece of data, we can't actually just solve it exactly. We don't have the computational power to do that. But we could take the approach of let's make a guess. Let me guess where the line goes. And then I can see like, well, how poorly did that line do? Let me do some type of evaluation of the error based on the existing data and that line. And maybe I'll just like kind of push the line in the direction where I try to like minimize that error. And I'll do that over and over and over and over again. And this is known as gradient descent. Okay, so this is why are we doing this? I want to make sense of high dimensional data that I cannot make sense of easily. <laughs> In order to do that, I want to build up some skills to make sense of low dimensional, one dimensional data. I can do that with a statistical approach, but when I get to the high dimensional data, I'm going to need to just do a sort of knob twisting, trial and error more like approach. 
So why not do the low dimensional data with that? And that is the most recent video that I made. Linear regression with gradient descent. Okay, so I then, I did this example without digging into the actual derivation of the formulas for how to make those adjustments. So, uh, you know, there's a, um, the formula for a line is y equals mx plus b, m being the slope, b being the y-intercept. And so these are the values that I'm tweaking to try to get the line in the right place. So when I did the video on uh, gradient descent, I uh, just used uh, uh, the formulas to do those tweaks. And then I said, I'm going to make some follow-up videos to derive those formulas. And am I logged into my YouTube account here? I am not. So I, uh, but I think if I go under playlists and under session three, so I have now unlisted these because the derivations of those formulas require a few rules from calculus. They require the power rule, the chain rule, and partial derivatives. And I made three videos on those topics. Uh, those videos weren't very good. They're not very good. They're bad. They're bad. Don't watch them. Um, you know, some people like them. I, you know, they were incredibly useful for me in that it forced me to kind of revisit a topic that I had once studied but haven't uh, spent a lot of time working with in my day-to-day -day coding life. Um, but I did discover something in the feedback and comments that I got, which was that I think people, while watching my channel, really enjoy the winging it approach when it comes to coding, the making mistakes, the trying to debug, that sort of part of something that everybody can relate to. Um, perhaps people learn the most when they see me trying to figure out an error and finally fix it, even if I can't fix it at all, but getting a suggestion from the chat. But I think that it wasn't as useful. I'm learning that maybe it's not as useful for me to try to walk through a topic from mathematics while winging it and not really knowing what I'm doing or where I'm going. So there's not as much of a sort of like live debugging aspect to trying to explain the chain rule in calculus. So I think these videos didn't turn out very well. Now, thankfully, uh, with some of the feedback, and I was going to read some of the comments, but I guess I don't need to do that. There is a YouTube channel called, I think, 3Blue1Brown. Uh, and 3Blue1Brown is a YouTube channel that has uh, lots of uh, mathematics and other related tutorials. In particular, there is a, um, oh boy, this Essence of Linear Algebra one. I definitely need that one too, which I'm going to get to. Um, there's this Essence of Calculus. So um, this, uh, what I'm going to do now, I think, is my approach is now, if I go back to my playlist, so I, right now these are still in the playlist, they're unlisted, I might remove them from the playlist, I'm not sure, but I think what I'm gonna do now, I'm still gonna have a 3.5 where I go through and derive the formula, but um, because I think that's useful because it's a specific formula that I'm using in my code and it kind of will relate and tie together and I'm gonna use it again and again in future neural network tutorials. But I think what I might do instead is instead of referring people for background, calculus background that I'm using to my videos, I'll refer people to the three blue, one brown videos, which are better <laughs> and more comprehensive. Um, so that's my current plan. So for today, I really would love, if I can today, to get to session four. And I think the thing, the thing that I get requested the most is really like do a whole multi-layered, feed-forward, fancy, super powered, all together magical neural network thing in you know, whatever your favorite language is of choice. I definitely will not be getting to that today, but I would like to build a perceptron today, a perceptron being a model of the simplest neural network possible, a network that really isn't a network at all, but a, a network of one neuron. The neuron receives inputs, the neuron fires an output. And what, what, how does that process work and how is that the building block for larger, multi-layered, more complex neural network systems. So that I would really like to do today. That's my goal. Um, before I get there, 
I think I'm going to attempt to do one follow-up to the gradient descent video where I derive the formula for how I change the weights. Do you hear that? I feel like there's always these like, and then, um, uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then go into the perceptron. How's that sound to you guys? Uh, I'm looking, I'm looking at the slide. Okay, so uh, let's see. First of all, let me just see if anybody's watching me today. 500 people are watching. Well, so that's <laughs> kind of amazing and great. I appreciate that. I, I've been feeling kind of a little blue down in the dumps a little bit over the last week because I really feel like I botched it up and kind of lost a little bit of confidence here. Uh, you know, this is all a learning experience for me. And, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I try to do is not be afraid to just try to explain something or try something live in a YouTube channel. And it doesn't always go so well. And it, it can be difficult to read the criticism, but I, I do have to say it was really uh, wonderful to read the comments from the last week on some of these calculus videos because they were written in such a thoughtful uh, and constructive way. And they were negative, but they were helpful and they were um, kind. Um, and so that I really, really appreciated. <laughs> code a game to, so I'm getting the chat to code a game to switch gears for a little bit. And I, I did, um, I was thinking, oh, let me take a break from the machine learning stuff today and do something different. But I feel like I, 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 I got to just keep pushing through it. So I think I'm going to push through it. I wanted to do two live streams this week and I failed to make that happen. Um, I also wanted to do a uh, um, Ada from the Slack group had an excellent suggestion to do something for uh, Pride Month and with rainbow colors, since you know I have an affinity for a rainbow-based imagery, as you might have noticed. Um, so that could be sort of a fun uh, uh, generative graphics things to do um, today. But I think I'm going to stick with my machine learning stuff because yeah, and 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 Julian right, don't listen to the haters on YouTube. So I get a lot of you know you can't be on a YouTube channel without getting a lot of like comments about how terrible you are with making your videos. And those, uh, you know, I, I read them. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's upsetting to read them. Sometimes they just kind of go right over. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to not be harassed. And I think that that is definitely an issue uh, um, that other YouTubers have to deal with. And it's a big problem with uh, online communities. So I don't want to get down, go down that road right now. But, I, you know, I think I'm pretty privileged here in terms of um, uh, the um, the, uh, the kind of audience reaction that I get. Um, but, um, I forgot what I was saying, but yeah, no, it, it wasn't a volume up, please. If people could let me know, um, if, uh, there's an issue with my volume. <laughs> um, I, I look at the chat, I completely lose my train of thought. It's kind of, I, well, this is one thing I've never been able to figure out how to do uh, effectively, which is kind of like read a chat and talk and like have a program in a whiteboard, all that sort of stuff. But um, I want to be clear, I didn't feel like people were unreasonably ne uh, commenting negatively about my videos. They were explaining what made sense to them, what didn't make sense, that they had knowledge about it, they were pointing out what could be more helpful, less helpful, all of that was great. Okay. Uh, yeah, Zer Grush Joe in the Slack channel uh, is a great point, which is, and I always say this to students, which is that, you know, I can be stuck on a problem for so long and I could just go and do something else for a while and somehow this like subconscious thinking about it without the pressure of having to solve it, when you come back to it, it's much easier to figure out and do. Um, and, um, keep your brain thinking about the subject even when you do something else and it helps you get through a wall. That's excellent, excellent point. Okay, um, now, so what I'm going to do uh, for, okay, a couple things. So I keep mentioning the Slack channel. Um, uh, I will just do my quick plugs for various things. If you're interested in supporting the work that I'm doing, even if you don't like, even if I make, supporting me, make trying to make videos that are bad and failing at them sometimes, um, you can go to patreon.com uh, slash coding train and there are a few um, rewards and things that you can get, a Slack channel that you can uh, join for by uh, signing up and supporting uh, this crowdfunding platform. Uh, you can also go to codingtrain.com storeenvy.com if you would like 
to get some coding trade merchandise. And I also always like to mention a nonprofit organization that I um, uh, help to administer called the Processing Foundation, which uh, maintains uh, the open source projects Processing P5JS and Processing uh, Python and a lot of other community uh, and education-based initiatives. And if you're interested, please join the uh, Processing Membership Program. And if you're, a U if you're in the United States, those donations are tax deductible. Uh, okay, so those are my three quick plugs. Uh, let me close this. Um, what I really want to do, I kind of, I'm not going to actually do this, but I have this very strong desire. You need oops, a um, to, uh, let me skip this. I, I'm like by accident playing an ad here to just play um, three blue brown videos and like watch them like Mystery Science Theater and like kind of like comment on them as they're going because they're really, really good. Okay. Uh, all right, so now. Um, okay, but let's see. So I'm just now I'm just taking a moment to breathe. Oh. This music hasn't driven me mad yet. I was wondering when it's going to drive people mad. Okay. All right, so let's see. Where am I time-wise? 21 minutes. So, okay. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away the pressure of um, right now this is going to be a recorded, edited video tutorial. And I'm going to talk through my understanding. I'm going to do a practice. I'm going to talk through my understanding of the math behind gradient descent. And then I'm going to listen to your feedback and look at read the chat, um, see what makes sense, see what notation is right, wrong, and then I will try to do it again as a video tutorial. And if for some reason, whatever I do right now is so amazingly brilliant and perfect, which it never will, which it won't be, then maybe I won't even bother to do it again. But um, let's just see how that goes. Okay, so... Um, I'm having a little bit of a runny nose today. Should I need to mute myself? Hopefully this won't blow out your ears. I feel like I want some kind of ridiculous whiteboard market po marker pocket protector thing. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm starting to think about just trying to program Frogger, by the way, which is a good idea. Uh, okay, so let's, let, let's think about this. Okay. So, to recap, I have a bunch of data points in 2D space. I have a line in that 2D space. The formula for that line is y equals mx plus b. Now, when I try to make a prediction, right, I get a piece, an input, a data input x, and from there I try to make a guess. And I, in addition to the guess, I have the known y. So this is the correct data that goes with x. My machine learning system makes a guess. The error is the difference between those two things. The error is y, the correct answer, minus the guess. But what happens when we look at this error, right, we don't care so much, right, okay, so, so that's the error. So there's an error, okay, so this relates to the idea of a cost function. 
a loss function. So if we want to evaluate how is our machine learning algorithm performing, we have this large data set. Maybe it has n elements. So what we want to do is from 1 to n for all n elements, we want to minimize that error. So the cost function, cost equals the sum of y sub i, every known answer, minus the guess sub i, squared. Is that something you can actually see? Yes, it is. So this is the formula. This is a cost, known as a cost function. This is the total error for the particular, in, the particular model, being the current M and B values that describe this particular line. This is the error. Now this error, hold on, I'm thinking here for a second. Tetris, I see people, all like that, I like glance over at the chat and I see Tetris. I go like, please, none of this. But you know, it was, oh, everybody wants machine learning, man. It's like the thing. I gotta do it. I gotta do some machine learning. You gotta teach machine learning. Every machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. Please teach machine learning. That's all I was hearing. And so I said, oh, I'll try that. I could learn that. I can understand it. I could teach that. It's hard. I'm having a hard time with it. <laughs> but I'm going to keep going. Okay. So perhaps we can agree, we can agree that our goal is to minimize this cost, also known as maybe a loss. We want to minimize that loss. We want to have the lowest error. We want the M and B values for the lowest error. So we want to minimize this function. Now, what does it mean to minimize a function? I'm trying to find the space on the whiteboard where I want to do this next piece. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I just like to go glance at the chat. Okay. Uh, okay, so now let me think. This might actually make it to be a video. It'll just, different pieces will get edited in different places. Okay. I'm tempted to, okay, so I'm going to, yeah, so I'm just going to, I'm going to draw, draw something here and then I'm going to erase it. So let's say I have a function like y equals x squared. See, what's confusing about this, what's so confusing, I, I've noticed in reading and doing a lot of reading and reading blog posts and watching other video tutorials, and this is something that I think I would be able to improve if I were writing this in a book, because it would give you a lot of time to kind of rethink, rethink, re-edit. But figuring out a, an appropriate and clear notation is very, is difficult, because I've got like, you know, this is a function, this like line, but now I'm going to talk about another function because this is a function. There's a y here, y equals x squared. So actually, I think what I want to do, I'm going to erase that for a second. I'm going to say, okay. So this function is something equals something squared, which is not that different from like me saying just for a moment, like y equals x squared. So if I were to take a Cartesian coordinate system and graph y equals x squared, it would look something like this. I'm drawing in purple now because I've stepped away from this notation and syntax for this particular scenario. And I'm just talking about a function in general, y equals x squared. Again, I can also write this like f of x equals x squared. But I'm graphing y equals x squared. So what does it mean to find, to minimize this function, right? I said I want to minimize the loss. I want the smallest error. I want the whatever line has the smallest error. Well, what it means to minimize a function is to actually find the x value that produces the lowest y. This is like the easiest thing in the world that we could ever possibly do right now. You don't need any calculus, fancy math, or anything to, to minimize this function. There it is. It's at the bottom. It's the lowest point. Zero. There it is. It's, I, can, I can see it. It's quite obvious. Um, so this is the thing. Eventually, 
we're going to, in, uh, in the machine learning systems that I'm going to get further into, neural network based systems with many dimensions of data, you know, there might be some much more hard to describe crazy function that we're trying to approximate that it's much harder, I mean, of course we could eyeball this as well, but it's much harder to sort of mathematically just compute exactly where the minimum is. Especially if you imagine this as instead of uh, a single line, but a bowl, and then what happens when you get into three dimensions and four dimensions and five dimensions? Things get kind of wonky. But there is, if we know the formula for this function, there is another way that you can find that minimum, that minima. Minima? Minimum? I don't know which it is. <laughs> um, and that is what I keep talking about, gradient descent. So let's think about what gradient descent means. Let's say the current error, sorry, uh, let's say this again, let's see. Um, let's say we're looking at this point here. And I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm a, I'm gonna walk along this function, and I'm like, I'm right here, and I'm like, hello, I'm looking for the minimum. Is it over there? Is it over there? Uh, could you help me, please? Could you please provide me? Can I use my like GPS, Google Maps thing to find the minimum? Uh, how would I find the minimum? Well, if I'm right here, I've got two options. I could go this way, or I could go this way. And if I knew which direction I could go, I could also say like, oh, I should take a big step, or I should take a little step. Right? There are all sorts of options. So I need to know which way to go and how big of a step to take. And there's a way to figure out how to do that. And it's known as the derivative. So the derivative is a term that comes from calculus. And I would refer you to three blue, one brown calculus series, where you can get a bit more background on how what the meaning of derivative is and how it works and how you can sort of think about these concepts from calculus. But for us right now, what we can think of is it's just the slope of the graph at this particular point. And a way to describe that is like a tangent line to that graph. So if I'm able to compute this line, then I could say, ah, well, this direction, if I go this direction, it's going up and I'm going away from the minimum. If I go this direction, I'm going down and I'm going towards the minimum. So I want to go down and you can see like over here, the slope is less extreme if I'm right here. So maybe I don't need to go very far anymore. But if I'm further up, that slope is going to point much more this way. Oh, I should take a bigger step down. So this idea of being able to compute this slope, this derivative of this function, tells me how to search and find the bottom. I'm going to pause for a second. Minima is plural. Uh, yeah, guess minus y. Um, <laughs> do it. I would love to see Frogger. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm not on the wrong screen now. Oops, this camera went off. Um, all right, so how am I doing so far? I'm going to pause for a second. <laughs> and everyone's yelling at me. I'm not going to do Tetris today, okay? I'm not in the, the right... Uh, I'm going to push through this. I don't understand this because I'm in the 10th grade, <laughs> says Thon. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right, thumbs up. Okay, okay. So I'm going to keep going here. Okay, so let me come back to here. Oh, look at this. This camera is pointing in a weird, did I bump it or was it always doing that? Green is there. There we go. All right. <laughs> Remember how I said I was going to practice? Now I just am sort of doing this. I might 
Um, I'm gonna, I should probably record an intro to it. Okay. Okay, so now, now that we have that established, that this idea of finding the derivative or the slope, the direction is a way of finding the minimum. So if this is the function then, what I, if I want to minimize this function, if I could somehow find the derivative of this function, I could uh, find the, uh, 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 okay, uh, 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 okay, <laughs> time out. We must establish a few more things to get a little further along here. Okay. Okay, so I want to say a bit more about this function. So about, about this, I'm, hold on, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm pausing, I'm thinking, hold on. <laughs> I'm always, by the way, completely standing outside of the frame. So I should stand over here if I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking about where I'm going next here. So I need to talk about, okay. Okay. Okay, so if you think back to the previous video, actually don't even think back. Let's go look in the code. Do I, hold on, I don't have this open. So, uh, I, Code. The point of doing this is because we're programming. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so this is the landscape of the, the puzzle we're trying to solve and pieces of that puzzle. But what is the full, what's the, what's the actual part of the code that I'm trying to give you more background on? The actual part of the code that I'm trying to give you more background on is right over here. So this is the gradient descent algorithm that I programmed in the previous video, where what I did is we looked at every data point, we made a guess, we got the error, the difference between the known output and the guess, and then we adjusted the m and b values. m equals, so the idea here is that we want to say every, for, as we're training the, um, I don't know which color I'm using right now, as we're training the system, I want to say m equals m plus, plus delta m, some change in m. b equals b plus delta b. So I want to know what is a way that I can change the value of m in y equals mx plus b in order to make the error less. I want to minimize the error. How do I do that? How should I change b in order to minimize the error? So the answer, which is in the code, is this just equals uh, you know, y minus guess times x times the learning rate. If we can forget about the learning rate right now, right? Uh, that's the answer that you can see in the code right here. Uh, the delta is error times x. For b, the delta b is just the error. So how do I get that? Okay, so I want to try to, to prove that this, why this works now. So I need to, I, I want to rewrite this function here in a slightly different way. This function, which I'm calling the cost function, let's call it j. j is a function based on m and b. So I want to get the error for m and b. I'm also going to remove the sum. And I'm just going to say, what's the error for any m and b equals, and I'm going to call this, I'm going to say, this is, where I'm, this is where I'm stuck and I might need some help with notation. I kind of want to call this like error. Error of x squared. Hmm, hold on, I'm stopping to think. Uh, 
Maybe I should give this a mathematical notation. If I give that h of x squared. OK. Let me start over here. OK, to do this, I'm going to attempt, I'm going to unfortunately start to use some more mathematical looking notation. And I'm going to try to describe it as I go. And hopefully, we won't get too lost. So this cost function, I'm going to call j. j, and it's really a function of m and b, right? I want to minimize the error for certain m and b values. That equals, and I'm going to get rid of the sum to simplify. I could keep the sum in there, but I'm going to get rid of the sum to simplify. That equals, and I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to take what's written here and call that h, a function h of x, right? What this actually is, is y minus, uh, is this something you can see, y minus mx plus b, right? That's the actual, um, and should I, should I have reversed that? Should it be guess minus y? I think I saw that. It should be guess minus y. It doesn't really matter because I'm squaring it, but uh, maybe I should fix that. And this red marker is hard to see. So let me go back to purple. This is like continuity. All right, let's see. I, I, I guess I'm going back on my, like, I'm going to do this twice. I'm actually just going to do this once, but really slowly and back up here and there. And Mathieu is going to have to do some magical editing. I feel like, why am I always out of the camera shot, too? I need to turn this more this way. Yeah, I'm like standing in the wrong place. OK, that's better. OK, so let me get the purple pen. OK, you know, I realize I kind of messed up. It's, in some ways, it doesn't matter because we're squaring this. But I think textbook-wise, I should really be thinking of the error as the guess minus the known. So let me just switch that for a second. OK, so notation-wise, I've now called the cost function j. And I want to call, I want to take, oops, I have this in my, <laughs> trying to do multiple colors here. I want to take this right here, guess minus y, and I want to call, I'm going to call that h. That's a function of x, actually. It seems weird, um, yeah. No, 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 sorry. It's not a function of x. What is it a function of? I just, it doesn't really matter. X is wrong. I'm going to use the chain rule. I know where I'm going with this, but I'm trying to think of the notation. Um, hold on. And now I'm going to have to work this out for a second. Because what I want to do is, if this is equal to h of x, then d of j according to m, this will be, is going to be the derivative of h of x why am I lost here? Uh, h of x times the derivative of h of x, right? Because then I'm going to get, oh, 2, but 2. Right, no, 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 sorry. Right, of course. Using the chain rule, but is the x misleading in here? Using the chain rule, I'm gonna, if, if this is h of x squared, then I'm gonna say two of that same, two times that same function times its derivative, you know, relative, you know, dh, dh relative to m. 
But does the X make sense there? Or is that confusing? I'm going to look in the chat, because then this is going to give me, this is, where I, this is where I'm going. Then this is going to give the two I can get rid of because the learning rate's going to cancel it out. I could have just added a one half. But so then this is going to be y, this function, which is, y, which is uh, guess minus y, guess minus y times the derivative of guess minus y relative to m, which is uh, mx plus b minus y. And all x and y, it's weird because x and y are constants here. I'm doing the derivative relative to m. So what I end up getting here is just x. So that's why I have the error times the input x. That's where I'm going. My question is, what is the proper, what's a good notation for me to use for the function that I'm going to have be this like error function? Let me go look at the chat now and see if anybody has any suggestions. That's what's usually used. J is a function of M and B. It's the guess that you're differentiating. Yeah, I know. Um, it's a function of Y. Oh, right. It's a function of Y and X. Uh, um, it's a function. So if I, I mean, usually the notation I see is just, Right, it's a function of y. I mean, it's just a function. Maybe I don't, you know what, maybe I shouldn't um, use the, maybe it actually, what I should do is not even, like, you know, I could go to any, um, let's look at, like if I go, let me, oops, let me just Google something like uh, gradient, Descent derived. What am I doing time-wise? Three o'clock. Um, like here, okay, so you can see here the H, like these are the weights of X. Yeah, the, those are the weights. So this is the, the, the theta here, the weights is equivalent of my like M and B. Yeah, the x and y's are constants. So it's not really, um, I think I should just call that, like you can see here, it's really also just a function of, this is funny, this is exactly what I'm doing. This was a good, <laughs> this was a good one to pull up. See, but this is, I'm trying to stay away from this notation that gets really, really difficult to read. See what I mean? I'm already lost. <laughs> uh, my y guess, I know, is a function of x. Um, let, me, let me come back to the uh, whiteboard here, which might help me here. I think what might actually be most useful is if I just call this H. If I just call that H. Or just call that error. I'm going to just call that error. That's an individual error. That's what I'm going to call that. OK. Let me try this. OK. I forgot where I was, but <sighs> try this again. <laughs> okay. All right. You guys, I, uh, I, I, I almost want to go look and see. I, I'm sure I've lost at least like 100 to 200 viewers in the last 20 minutes. I will get back to making things like 
Tetris and Frogger and that type of thing eventually. Okay, whoops, I don't know why I just erased that. Uh, okay, so let me come back to this point here. Okay, so in order to figure out what these delta values are, I need, want to rewrite this function again <laughs> for the millionth time, I think. But I, I want to use some. Okay, I'm going to rewrite this with some from different notation to try to help keep things going here. So this cost function I'm going to call j. J is a function of m and b. So this loss, right, there are some values. There's a value of m and b. And when I have a particular value of m and b, I can look at all of the errors across all of the points, sum them up, and I want to find the m and the b with the lowest value. Now, a, another way of writing this up here is I could just take this guess, this guess minus y, and I could call that uh, error. So I'm going to say that j this is really a function. j is a function of the error squared. I want to minimize, I want minimize the error squared. I want the least squared error. So here's the thing. What, again, what value of m, how can I change m to minimize what this is? I can figure out which way to go along the, uh, I can, w <laughs> I'm just sorry, I'm taking a, I guess it'll be fun when I get to back propagation. <laughs> okay, I think I've got this now. But I realized I kind of like have a continuity problem. So I've got to come back. And I gotta go back to where. <laughs> there was a time in my life where I made these videos without doing them live. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go, everybody. This is take 408,020 million. <laughs> the next step that I wanna do is find the minimum cost. I want to minimize this function for a particular, I want to find the m and b values for the, with the lowest error. So to do that, we've established that gradient descent says if I could find the derivative of a function, I know which way to move to minimize it. So somehow I need to find the derivative of this function to know which way to move. Okay, so in order to do that though, I'm gonna to have to rewrite this function in a different way. So a couple things. One is I think I made a mistake earlier where, uh, this should actually be, it doesn't, it, it's, it sort of doesn't matter, but this should be um, guess minus y. I mean, we're squaring it, so in a way the positive negative doesn't matter, but I think this is important for later. So this should be guess minus y. That's technically the error is uh, guess minus y, not y minus guess. Okay, so I'm gonna call the error function j, and j is a function of m and b. So I get some, no, I'm sorry, not the error function. Oh, because I'm about to call something else the error function. The loss function, the cost function, j. Then I'm actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just simplify this guess minus y, and I'm going to call that error. And I'm also going to take out the summation. The summation is kind of important, it, but it, this has to do with that stochastic versus batch gradient descent that I talked about in the previous video, where I could I want to get the error over everything, or I just want to look at each error one at a time. So let's simplify things and say we're looking at each error one at a time. So I'm going to now say this equals error squared. So I have essentially rewritten this function and simplified it. The cost j is equal to this error, the guess minus y squared. So what I want to do is I want to find the derivative of j relative to m. I want to know how do I minimize j? How, how does j change when m changes? d of j relative to m. Okay, so 
in, uh, you know, again, I recommend that you go and check out some of the three blue, one brown calculus videos, which will help give you more background here. But um, what I'm actually going to need to do here is use, a, use two rules from calculus. I'm looking for another pen color for no reason. I need to use the power rule. That is one rule. And I need to use the chain rule. These are two rules. Uh, um, so there are two rules that I need to do. The power rule for a derivative is actually just take the exponent. To take the derivative of something squared, I take the exponent, I subtract 1 from it, and then I multiply. I take the exp. Ah, let's just do it. Let's, let, me, let me just. <laughs> Back around. OK. L I'm really trying to, like somehow I thought like using multiple colored markers would solve all my problems. Clearly doesn't. Um, okay, let me, let me establish what the power rule is really quickly. If I have a function like f of x equals x to the n, the power rule says that the derivative is n times x to the n minus 1. So that's the power rule. So I'm going to now apply that here and I'm going to say, uh, I don't know why I'm in purple now, but I am. 2 times error to the first power. The other thing, however, is though, I want to know how j changes, not according to error, but according to m. m, error is a function of m. Error is actually a function of m and b as well. So the chain rule says, what I can do is now say, I can take this error function, I can get the derivative, which is just 2 times error, and then I can multiply it by the derivative of that error itself relative to m. So the cost, the derivative of this cost function that I'm trying to minimize relative to, say, m is I really want to swear. I never swear on the channel, but I realize like I've got a lost. I got you know. I, I, there's just so many pieces here that I'm like glossing over and skipping. But I'm gonna just keep going with this for a second. I'll double back, I guess, if I have to. I just th this is not adequate. The chain rule is like I'm kind of glossing over this detail. So like, is there really any point of me deriving this if I haven't really explained the chain rule? I guess I have that other video where I explain the chain rule, but I didn't like that other video. <laughs> really, really struggling with what to do here. Uh, okay. Uh, but I'm going to keep going. Two times error times. Okay. Let me, maybe I'm going to try to explain the chain rule really quickly. Okay. Let me back up for a second. So I did the power rule. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, let me try to, uh, okay, so the power rule says now two times error, okay, but I also need the chain rule, I'm not done, why do I need the chain rule? Well, the chain rule is a rule, I'm gonna erase this over here, and use another marker because somehow if I just use multiple colored markers, all of this will make sense. The chain rule states, whew, okay, let's say I have a function like y. Can you, can you see this orange? y equals uh, x squared. And I have a function like x equals z squared. So y depends on x, x depends on z. Well, what the chain rule says is if I want to get the derivative of y relative to z, what I can do is I can get the derivative of y relative to x to x, and then multiply that by the derivative of x relative to z, which is then 
times 2z. So that's the chain rule. I can kind of chain these derivative functions. I have two functions, and I can get the derivative of one. Boy, I, I, I should have stopped it while I was ahead. I, I can chain derivatives. I can get the derivative of one relative to something times the derivative of that something relative to something else. And that's actually weirdly what's going on here. Um, it may not be immediately apparent to you, but j is a function of error. Error is actually a function of m and b, right? Because the guess is some, uh, so, 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 I, sometimes I just have to like say the statement and move on. <laughs> j is a function of error, and error is a function of m and b, because I'm computing the error as the guess, mx plus b minus a known y. So here, I could then say, get this derivative, 2 times error, and multiply that by the derivative of that error function itself relative to m, because if I'm trying to get delta m. Now, I could also, also do it relative to b when I want delta b, and this has to do with a partial derivative. Ooh, see, there's so many concepts baked into this that are a lot. <laughs> and maybe and Again, I'm sitting here being like, this is all just a bad idea. OK, but what is this? This is actually quite simple to work out. Um, and I'm going to do that for you right now. I'm going to get the black marker. And what I'm going to do is now, I want the derivative of error relative to m. OK, well, what is this actual, if I unpack this function, guess is mx plus b minus y. Error equals this. So when I say partial derivative, I mean like the derivative relative to m, what I mean is everything else is a constant. x is a constant, b is a constant, y is a constant. I mean x and y are actually already constants because those are the things that x is the input data, y is the known uh, uh, output result. So this, really, I should write this as like x times m plus b minus y. So this, the derivative of this, right, the power rule says 1 times x times m to the 0 power, which means x. And the derivative of a constant is 0, because the constant doesn't change, right? Derivative describing how something changes. The derivative of this is 0. So guess what? It's just x, meaning this whole thing turns out to just be x equals 2 times the error times x. And guess what? This 2, we're going to, the whole point of this, if you watch the previous video, is we're going to take this and multiply it by something called a learning rate. Because we want it to, we want to like, we know the direction to go. This is giving us the direction to go to minimize that error, minimize that cost. But do I want to take a big step or a little step? Well, if I'm going to multiply it by a learning rate anyway, it's sort of like this 2 has no point because I could have a learning rate that's twice as big or half as big. So ultimately, this is all it is, error times x. All of this math and craziness with power rule and chain rule and partial derivative this, it all boils down to just, finally we get this, error times x. That's what should go here in delta m. Guess what? Let's go back over to our code, edit point. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, K, K Weekman, thank you for a good, uh, okay. Oh, where am I here? Oh, why did I? Whoops. <laughs> we go back to our code, and we can see there it is. Uh, error times x. Error times x. There we go. That's it. That's why that says error times x. That was a, that was a lot, but that's why it says it. I feel so happy that we 
kind of, even though it was not the best explanation and there's lots of confusing missing pieces, I feel very happy to have arrived there. This was useful for me. Just making this video makes me feel like something happened today. <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to make sure. I had a comment in the chat and maybe I have, yes, 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 yes. This should say, ah, this is a big mistake here. Uh, wait, hold on. No, it's not. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, chain rule. Okay, 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 okay. That's, oh, that's not a mistake. But, okay. So, okay, where's my purple marker? I put the wrong cap. I put the wrong cap. Oh, there it is. I'm putting the caps on the wrong markers. <laughs> my kids do this all the time. They put the, like, they put all, like, none of the markers have the correct caps on them. It drives me crazy. Okay, hold on. Okay, two things I want to mention, a couple things I want to mention here. Uh, a way that I can make this make a little bit more sense here, a little, just to clarify this chain rule thing a little bit better, th thank you to Kay Weekman in the uh, uh, Slack channel, um, is that I could, just to see here, I'm, what I'm looking for is the derivative of the cost function you know, relative to m. What happens when I change the m value? What does that do to the cost? And the chain rule says that if I look at the derivative of that function sorry, relative to the error, I can multiply that by the derivative of the error relative to m. Right? So this is actually the chain rule. So I can get this by doing the derivative of relative to error, the derivative of error relative to m. And that's what's going on here. 2 times error times this, and that's where I'm getting all this stuff. Okay, so this is one way of looking at this, and you can see like, ah, yeah, it's kind of like the numerator and denominator cancel each other out, so that makes sense. The other thing is, if I did this whole thing again, but did the derivative down here relative to b, right, b instead of uh, m, what do I get here? Well, I get, this is now a constant, so this becomes zero. This is a constant, this becomes zero. And what is this? This, I take the power rule, so I take 1 times b to the 0, I just get 1. So this becomes uh, error times, rather than times, boy, look at this mess that I wrote here. Can, I, can we please end this video with this at least written is the very nice handwriting? <laughs> um, so when it's relative to m, this was 2 times error times x. But when it's relative to b, that's when it's relative to m. But when it's relative to b, it's 2 times error times 1. And again, we could get rid of the 2. So it's really just error times x or error times 1. And then if I come back over here again, there you go. Error times x. m changes by error times x. b changes by just error. <sighs> so, um, that hopefully gives you some more background as to why these formulas exist this way. And look at the chat. And uh, as I go forward in session four, what comes after this is now session four, where I'm going to build a neural network model for learning. You're going to see this formula over and over again. Change the weight. Instead of saying m and b, I'm going to say the weight. Well, the weight changes based on the input multiplied by the error. And then there's going to be a lot of some other pieces there, but this formula is going to be everywhere. So I hope <laughs> this was another attempt. Uh, um, again, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of things I've glossed over here in terms of um, a lot of the background, in terms of you know, what really is a derivative, why does calculus exist. You know, why does the chain rule work the way it works? Why does the power rule work the way it works? What's, why, what, 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 that partial derivative, huh? Did you say something about partial derivative? And so again, take a look at this video's description and I'm going to point you towards resources and tutorials that kind of dive into each of those components a bit more deeply, but hopefully this gives you some semblance of that overall picture. Okay, thanks for watching and uh, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe you want to hit like or subscribe, but honestly, totally, totally understand. Totally, totally understand. Don't you, you get the thumbs down? I, I, I get it. I get it. Okay, I'll see you in a future video, maybe. Okay, goodbye. Uh...
<laughs> People in the chat are, are you, I can't tell if you're actually worried about me or if you just like are tired of watching this because lots of people are saying, please take a break from this math stuff. The thing is, um, I'm just going to feel so happy once I'm done with all this math stuff. Uh, and honestly, I'm, maybe I should just do this on my own time, but you know, I'm kind of figuring this stuff out uh, in the, okay. So, um, all right, both. I don't know what both means. Okay, so one thing that I need to do is I need to do a quick, since somehow instead of doing what I said I was gonna do, which I was just gonna work out the math, and then kind of like, once I figured it out, make a video tutorial, I kind of just worked it out and stopped and started and I made a big giant editing puzzle again um, for uh, Mathieu. Um, and this might be another video that I post and then decide to like take off the internet. But um, you know, anyway, when I say take off the internet, I'm never gonna delete this. So anybody wants to watch this and offer some feedback, maybe learn something, maybe not learn something, it'll always be there. It's just a matter of whether I include it publicly in the playlist as part of the course materials. And um, that's sort of the question I'm wrestling with. Um, but I do think I need to, now that I've done this, um, <laughs> but I do think I need to, now that I've done this, come back and um, uh, just do like a one or two minute uh, spiel for the beginning of this video. Okay. Uh, so did I get it, am I getting this y minus uh, guess and guess minus y thing all wrong all over the place in multiple places? I don't know. Uh, okay, so here we go. I'm gonna. Hello, it's me coming to you again from the future. You might recognize me some from my failed videos as uh, calculus partial derivative. Anyway, I made some videos with some calculus stuff. They didn't turn out very well. You can find them if you want. They're kind of unlisted now. But I just I tried again. And so this video, if you're watching it, this is a follow-up to my linear regression with gradient descent video. That video stands alone. It's a programming video where all I do is walk through with the code for how to build an example that demonstrates linear regression with gradient descent. And this is a puzzle piece in my machine learning series that will hopefully act as a foundation and a building block to your understanding of hopefully some more creative or practical examples that will come later. This video that, if you're watching, is totally optional to watch as part of this series because you, the, I just applied the formula. But what I tried to do in this video is give some background. And I, I kind of worked it all out here. This is the end. This is what's on the whiteboard. I, I thought somehow if I used multiple colored markers, it would somehow make a better video. I don't think I really succeeded at that. But um, so I kind of walked through and tried to describe the math. I should say that you know, uh, this involves uh, topics from calculus. And there's a great video series by three blue, one brown on YouTube that gives you great background and more depth in calculus. So I, I'll put links to those videos in this video's description. Honestly, if you're really interested in kind of soaking up as much of this as you can, I would go and watch those videos first and then come back here. It'll give you that background for uh, uh, understanding the pieces that I've done here. So I look forward to your feedback, uh, positive and negative, uh, constructive feedback into whether this was helpful and if it made sense. And um, if you then go on and keep uh, watching, there'll be some future videos where I'll be getting back into the code. But there's no code in this video, just some math stuff, maths, maths. Okay, uh, enjoy. Okay, it's backwards in the code, that's why the plus works there. Oh, I see. So it should be minus, got it, got it, got it. Okay, you know, I always just try it one way or the other. Here I am, okay. Um, all right, so we did it, everybody. We did it, we did it, we did it, we did it, woohoo! We can, party time, excellent! Can I please be done now? <laughs> can I just like never make a video again? I guess I will keep going. All right, first I need some water, because I have to admit, I didn't really stay very hydrated throughout that, which I think is a bit of a problem. I saw somebody in the uh, patron group on Slack pointed me towards the dance your own PhD thesis competition, which is really wonderful. I feel like I should do a dance version of gradient descent. 
which would be maybe something like this. Um, okay, so now I think the next thing, there's two things I could do right now. There's so many things I could do right now. I have, I have a fair amount of time. I just have over an hour before I have to go, so there's a good amount of time. Um, let's try our little, let, I don't know if I should do the straw poll thing. It's always a terrible idea, but let's, um, whoops. Um, so let me talk you through, <laughs> sorry, I, I spilled some water on my trackpad, so I'm fixing that. Okay, let me, um, there's nothing running there. Uh, I just want to, I'm going to show you two things that I could do. Uh, I could, um, so one thing is, um, there's still one example, which is basically this. So this is an example that uses a JavaScript library to do regression. And you can see here, it's exactly what you imagine in that uh, it's just the same as my ordinary least squares video, but this is just using a library that does the computation behind the scenes. And I can also do polynomial regression, which means I can try to find a function that's a curve that fits this. And you can see this is actually the function that's fitting it best. You can see this is uh, with, so I, I could do this, which I think has a lot of interesting applications, just in terms of visuals and graphics even. Um, so that's one example I could build and demonstrate. Next, that's as like a one last piece in this uh, week of classification and regression, the session three. Or I could go straight to um, working through the perceptron, which I actually, you know what, I have a, um, I have some uh, slides of some diagrams. So, uh, um, So I could, this is the simplest model of a neural network, a single perceptron that receives two inputs and does an output, and I could walk through the code and the particular algorithm for how it works and build an example of the perceptron. I want to do both of those today. So the question is, should I skip the regression and go straight to the perceptron, or should I work on the regression with the, uh, and I'm trying to decide. And should I do it in processing? Should I do it in JavaScript? I don't know. I, uh, so let me, uh, let me straw poll this, because I'm so indecisive, and somehow I think this is going to uh, which go straight to Perceptron. Um, uh, do poly, do, do uh, other regression, uh, do regression library example first even even if that limits even if that pushes perceptron to next week like which one should i guarantee which one should i guarantee that i do i don't know that i have time for both <laughs> uh, so i'm going to create this poll i think i should go straight to the perceptron should i vote uh, this is the poll strawpoll.com slash E3GER81, somebody who's a moderator uh, it could maybe put that in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to just go to view results. There's no results yet. I guess you guys are behind. Oh, mentioned the dangers of overfitting. Yeah. Go straight to Perceptron. Good to see. All right, all right, that looks pretty clear to me. Um, all right, so I'm leaning towards go. I, I mean, I'm going to do everything that I have on my list at some point. It's just sort of like what order do I do those things in? I, I kind of I would be very glad to go straight to the perceptron to be to be honest. Um, okay, that's that's pretty clear. So now, um, you know, even I I, I don't see how. Uh, I don't see how anything else is going to come back. OK, go straight to the perceptron. OK. So next I'm going to, I'm just curious. I'm going to do another straw poll. <laughs> uh, 
Perceptron. Processing Java, p5.js, JavaScript. So I'm always curious about. Uh, create pull. Okay, so now here's the next one. 593YBE6. And I'll take a look at these results in a little bit. I suppose I could still look at that other poll, but uh, okay. Oh, fascinating. This is a close one, everybody. Ty goes to processing, by the way. gets like 40% of the votes, I feel like I'm doing processing. Get some more votes for processing in there. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm amazed how many people are voting and how many people are actually watching this. <laughs> Good work, everybody. It's coming back. I'll post the link to the poll. Strawpoll.com 593. The coding trade brought to you by Strawpoll.com. Do you think if I just like make random endorsements, people will start sending me checks in the mail? Probably not. Look at this, this is amazing. This is like much too exciting. Okay, I gotta give this, I was gonna wait till this song is over, and yet this song actually has two minutes left. The Python, the Python is coming. I'm gonna be doing some Python this summer. I should really just do this every day. Well, how come, why is life so hard and there's so many other things I have to do? Think of how much many videos I could make if I was just here every day. Okay. Ah, look at that! <laughs> you guys are just the opposite of trolling me or giving me a life here, okay. All right, I'm gonna give this. <laughs> Woohoo! Th here's the thing, I have the example. I'll make it in both. It's just a matter of what I'm gonna do this video. Okay, I'm gonna fade out the music. You have one more minute to vote. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Senegal! Oh, 
All right, and the final tally is processing with 124 votes, p 5 Jess with 104 votes, and I totally didn't influence that at all. I mean, I wasn't, I was like totally not influencing that at all. Um, all right, that's nice. Let's do some processing today. It's a good, it's, it'll be good. It'll be good. Um, I will happily um, do it twice. If necessary, I will uh, port the code. This is not, I'm not writing new code. Um, what I'm going to do is program and talk through a particular example that is already written about in chapter 10 of um, Nature of Code book with a little bit of background. Um, and uh, the code on the website is all in uh, processing. But I also have, uh, if I go to nature of code examples, P5JS, and I go to chapter 10, there is a uh, JavaScript version of it right here. So rest assured that there is a JavaScript and processing version out there for you. And what matters here is the concepts, the algorithms, not the language. Okay, Perceptron Polka. I love that. Okay, so now I need to get myself ready. Let's see what version of, um, let me close this. I think this might actually, I might consider this to be a coding challenge video. And I should do like a session four introduction. Okay, so there is a newer version of processing. Let me get that. Um, download that. By the way, once again, I will just mention while I'm downloading processing, ah, oh, so many things I want to do uh, that I'm so behind. My to-do list is really out of control. Uh, but anyway, uh, please consider becoming a member of processing. Um, I know that I often mention my Patreon and I'm thrilled and honored and I, I uh, for the support that people give me personally uh, via Patreon but I think that it's also important and perhaps more, and actually definitely more important to support uh, nonprofit uh, open source development. Um, and you can do so through the Processing Foundation uh, if you're interested. Okay, um, now, uh, let me get the most recent version of processing, which is 3.3.3. .3. Copy that to the desktop here and replace that. And I can't, it's in use, close this. Close this. Here we go. <sighs> okay, so now, let me open up processing. Let me open up my, guess what, I have slides. <laughs> Can you believe that I have slides? It's only because I have the diagrams for the Nature of Code book and I put them into a PDF, so I can use those. Um, so let me get this going here. Uh, how is this font size? Font size okay? Uh, maybe it should be a tiny bit bigger. I guess maybe it's fine. Uh, Perceptron. Oh, you know what? I don't want to call that. Um, what do I want to call this? Uh, hold on. What did I do in Nature of Code? I want to have a class, the Perceptron class. So, so what did I do? Let me look at the code here. Let me. Oh, I just, I see. I called it like simple perceptron and had an example number. So yeah, why don't I do that? So this is a uh, coding challenge, simple perceptron. And I will make a new tab when I get to it. I'm gonna add a setup and draw in advance. How's that font size? People are, I, I, if someone in uh, Slack could tell me if the font size is okay, it's too hard for me to follow the, uh, oh, hi Simon. Simon is watching. Simon is a wonderful viewer. Uh, hello, I love watching your videos. Uh, 
make a P5.js version. Uh, Simon has actually been uh, porting a lot of, of, of my uh, examples back and forth. Um, and so I will definitely make a P5.js version, absolutely. And if anybody wants to contribute that, um, I welcome that too. Okay. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, looks fine. Size is good. You can see things kind of in 120p. Okay, sorry, I lost my train of thought. All right. You guys okay? It's okay for me to erase this beautiful diagram. It looks so dark, by the way. I'm looking over at my monitor and everything seems so dark. I need better lighting. Um, okay, so I'm gonna erase this. Everybody's okay with that? So speak now. As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. Song, this dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. One of these days, I will get one of those glass panels that goes in front of you, you can draw on it. Um, okay. Vista. Vista, Vista, the Vista song. <clears throat> okay. So, I think what I'm going to do in this particular, so at some point, I need to make an intro to session four video, which will kind of give a little bit of background about neural network-based learning, some references and resources to historical uh, references and resources. Um, but I'm going to put that aside for right now. And so then the first video will simply be a coding challenge where I just launch right into the perceptron. So what I need to do in this video is kind of explain what a perceptron is. Um, and um, what a perceptron is and define a simple scenario to, uh, to solve with a perceptron, write all the code for it to implement that, and then towards the end, I mean, kind of reference why the single neuron, the simple perceptron model, isn't particularly useful, but can serve as a building block for larger, um, uh, multi-layered perceptron-based systems that can actually do all sorts of things. So that's kind of my overview of what I'm going to attempt to do. <clears throat> um, and then, so that's my overview. One thing that I want to reference is, if I'm in week four, okay. So I think that this is probably, let's look on Wikipedia to see if I'm um, missing anything really sort of key here in terms of historical background. Actually, I, um, okay. Right, 1957. Uh, Right, 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 right. Okay. I mean, you know, there's a lot of soup. Uh, okay. So I think this is a single, um, I think this is a single video with not very much editing, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah. 
Look at all this interesting. Sorry, I'm like looking at all this uh, stuff on the Wikipedia page. Okay. All right. So, sorry, I'm thinking about what is the best scenario here. Mm. Mm. I'm just going to get started. Okay. <laughs> when am I going to? Ollie in the chat asks, when are you going to make a tutorial about Chrome extensions? Uh, soon, I hope. I mean, I do, like, that's something I'm going to teach in the fall for sure. Um, so at some point I will uh, make those tutorials. I should really do this sooner than later because I won't have to do a lot of, like, math stuff. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Here we go. This is going to be... Coding challenge number, what number am I on here? What number coding challenge am I on? Coding challenge number 71, it looks like. Oh, load more, nope. 72, coding challenge number 72. For a second I thought I, forgot, thought I had forgotten to record this to disk, but I'm okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here it is. Okay. Let me. Okay. Um, all right, all right, all right. I, sorry, I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm not really, but I'm... It's 4 o'clock, so I have an hour. This is the last thing I'm going to do today. I will, if there's time, I'll answer some questions, but I have to be done by 5, which is an hour from now, and I can only assume that this won't take an hour. <laughs> but... There's a lot of pieces to it. This is not the simplest thing to, I mean, the Perceptron itself is incredibly simple, but in terms of designing a whole system to um, demonstrate it, that can be a little bit um, trickier. So, um, but we're gonna go for it anyway. Okay, here we go. Wait, no. Hello, it's time for the Perceptron poke. No, no. That was a bad idea. Hello. Welcome to another coding challenge. This coding challenge is part of my uh, intelligence and learning series. And in this coding challenge, I am going to attempt to make something called a perceptron. And you know, this is a piece of the puzzle. I'm uh, working towards this path of eventually, <laughs> can I please start over? Can I have one mulligan here? This is, this is, this is uh, what happens to me. Oh, it starts to get warm in here. Okay. Oh. Sorry, hold on. I think um, I'm going to lose the sweatshirt because it's getting a little bit warm in here. So we will change to just a t-shirt. Oops. I do have a slight problem here, which is that I need to fix the mic. Like this. Okay, is the sound okay still? Can you, everybody hear me okay? Uh, sound good? Okay. Uh, move some stuff over. Okay, this is, this coding challenge is really gonna happen now. Okay, here we go. Hopefully the sound, everyone's saying yes, the sound is okay. Okay. Hello, welcome to a coding challenge. In this coding challenge, I am going to attempt to make a perceptron. This is part of a whole bunch of videos that I'm doing about neural network-based learning. 
And, uh, but in this video, I'm not kind of getting into too much about the whole broader landscape of everything history-wise and future-wise about what's happening with neural network-based learning. In this example, I just want to build with code the simplest model of an artificial neural network possible known as a perceptron. Perceptron, um, uh, the concept of perceptron was invented by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957 at the Cornell Aeronautical Libra Laboratory. Um, I, there's a link here uh, to the original paper, which I will include in this video's description if you want to take a look at that. Um, and of course, you can always find more on the Perceptron uh, Wikipedia page. But what I'm going to do now is talk about what it is. <laughs> okay, so what is a Perceptron? Now, <laughs> I'm going to go back over here. <laughs> I forgot that I had diagrams. Okay, what is a Perceptron? Mm. Failure. Okay, whoops. Hold on. This can be. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Try again. Okay. What is a perceptron? Oh, ah. So, ultimately, what we're do, what I'm doing in this coding challenge, is building an artificial neural network. Now, it's using the word. <laughs> ah, I was doing just fine. Okay. Okay. Do I need this diagram? This is, yeah, okay, okay, oh no, no. By the way, there will be editing in this coding challenge. It's hereby announced. I gotta just, I gotta get, I'm really in my own head here. I just gotta shake it all off and let it go. Here we go. Okay, what is a perceptron? Why are we making a perceptron? So, <laughs> why? What is the deal with this? Uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> what is a perceptron? Uh, why, why are we here? Why are we making this? So the idea here is to be inspired by the way the actual brain works. The idea of the brain, you know, and again, this is not a video on the brain and neuroscience, but the idea is that the brain has neurons in them. Those neurons receive, see if I really, Am I really, really explaining? Do I, do I really, is this diagram really a part of? Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I'm gonna get some momentum here in a second. <laughs> okay. What is a perceptron? Why am I even here talking about this? So ultimately, I want to look at artificial uh, intelligence, machine, neural network based machine learning systems that are inspired by and modeled loosely off of the idea of the actual brain. The actual brain being this thing with like neurons and axons that connect to other neurons and dendrites that receive inputs. I actually don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just reading what's ever on this diagram. But a perceptron, and ultimately, where I'm going to start building examples and show you examples of lots of these sort of these components that are all interconnected, and inputs are coming in, and, and outputs are flowing out. But I want to start with this idea of the perceptron being a model of a single neuron, the simplest possible artificial neural network that we could build, and this will serve as the building block for future examples that I will make in future videos. Okay, so let's come over to the whiteboard for a second. So if the idea of a perceptron is that there is a single neuron, call this a neuron, that neuron could have inputs. Let's say there are two inputs. I'm gonna call them x, zero, x, index one, so inputs zero and one they come into the neuron, some type of mathematical process happens in the neuron, and then there is an output, which I'll call Y, or output. So these are inputs. And again, this diagram, it might look familiar to you if you've watched some of my other videos, because I often talk about this idea of there is some amount of inputs, a long list of inputs, that go into some machine learning recipe that processes all those inputs and performs a task. Maybe it tries to classify 
uh, or perform a regression, but make some sort of output, some sort of prediction. So this is exactly what this perceptron is designed to do. Okay, here's the thing. In order for us to understand and look at all of the pieces of what's happening in here, we need some scenario. I have these, I never have like pre-made diagrams, but since I have these, I'm going to go back and forth and use them. So this is the pre-made scenario that I'm going to use. What I want to do is, I want to perform classification. I want to find out if some points are on one side of a line or another side of a line. Um, and so, does this make sense what I'm saying here? Yeah. Maybe I won't, maybe I won't, I don't need this diagram. I'll just draw that and go back. Oops, I'm on the wrong camera. So let's come up with a scenario that we can use. So let's say I have a two-dimensional space. You can think of this, this will be my canvas, my window. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to arbitrarily divide the space with some line. Some points will be on one side of the line and other points will be on another side of the line. So essentially, I, what I want to do is use this perceptron for a classification problem. I want to say that these belong to you know, class A and these belong to class B. So, and I'm going to use a supervised learning strategy. So um, for background on some of this, you could go and watch session three of my intelligence and learning series where I do some other videos about classification and regression using a linear regression model. There's a lot of crossover here. But uh, anyway, you can stay here if you want. I'm going to kind of talk through everything. But the idea is I want to classify these. So I want these inputs to be, so x0, for any point right here like this, x comma y, it's a little bit confusing the way I'm using, uh, it's, I don't, I hate, I, I don't love this because I should really think of the, the x is input 0, the y is input 1, right? The x is input 0, the y is input 1, the output is class A or class B, the y. So I'm using x and y in two different places in slightly different ways, which is a bit confusing, but hopefully will make sense as we continue to go along here. Okay, so, but I actually want to say instead of, um, instead of A and B, what I actually want to say is plus 1 and negative 1. So the idea is that my perceptron is going to output a plus one if the point belongs to group A, and it's going to output a negative one if the point belongs to group B. So how does, and we're going to use the technique known as supervised learning. And what supervised learning involves is I am going to ask the perceptron, I'm going to say, here is some input, give me a guess but I know the correct answer. I'm going to give the perceptron a point that I know should be in A. And it's going to guess either A and B. If it guesses A, I'm going to say, great job, perceptron, you keep on going. If it guesses B, I'm going to say, perceptron, you made a mistake. Let's tweak something about your algorithm to try to get you to the correct answer. And this tweaking is a process known as gradient descent, and it's something that I've also covered in a couple different videos that I will also link to down here. And we're going to go through it as I get through here, okay? So that's the supervised learning process. Okay, so what is the actual algorithm? What happens here inside the neuron? So here, there's, here's the missing piece. And there's a, there's a few different missing pieces that I get to over time. <laughs> I was stepping on something, I don't know what it was. These you can think of as connections. The inputs flow into this neuron, but are weighted, weighted, weighted as they flow in. So each one of these connections has a weight. I'm going to say W0, W index, W1. So at e these inputs are weighted. And what the perceptron does, its algorithm is to create a sum of all of the inputs multiplied by the weights. That sum is x input times, sorry, 
Input zero times weight zero plus input one times weight one. Now in this case, the perceptron only has two inputs. So this is a very easy formula to write. As you're going to see as I get into future videos, you might realize like, oh, there's a hundred inputs or a thousand inputs or a hundred thousand inputs. But this same formula is always going to apply. A weighted sum of all the, the inputs. Input zero times weight zero, input one times weight one, add them all up together. So that's step one is the sum. Step two before, so you could say like, okay, well you take that and that's the output, but this isn't the output. Step two is something called an activation function. Activation function. And this is a key concept in neural network based machine learning. As I get into future videos, we're going to see there's a variety of different kinds of activation functions. And why might you use this one or this one? And what do they do and why? But typically what an activation function does is it allows you to conform the output to some desired range um, and do things, and, and, and in another way, actually another way to think about it is if you think about that idea of the brain, like you can think of does the, does the neuron fire and continue to send its data along or does it not? So what happens as the data comes out of that neuron? We're going to use, in this particular example, we're going to use a very, very simple activation function. You can think, okay, well I only want two outputs. I want a plus one or a negative one. How can I take any number? I can take any number and convert that number into plus one or negative one. How would I do that? How about a function called sine? Take the sign of any number n. If that number n is positive, then I get a plus 1. If that number n is negative, then I get a negative 1. Okay? So that's the activation function. This is the whole process. It's, off, it's often referred to as feed forward. The inputs come in. They get multiplied by the weights. They get added together, and then that weighted sum gets passed through an activation function. And then that activation function gives us a plus one or a negative one, should the neuron fire or not fire, and that gets sent out, and that's the output. Okay, pause for a second. So there's a lot more to this, but I think what I'm going to do is go and write the code for this now. I'm going to just check and see if there's any questions. Audio sounds fine. What about zero? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I can't see what that chat message was. I'm reading in the chat. There's like a message that says, I feel bad for anyone older than like 25. <laughs> Boy, I've got, I've got some serious problems then. Is this, is the focus on the whiteboard okay? Can you see it? Looks like it's fine to me. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. So there's good questions here. Okay. Okay, I'm back from, I was just checking a live chat that's going on. If you're watching this in an archive, that live chat doesn't exist. But there are two important questions before I move on. Number one is, what do you do with zero? Eh, I don't know. We could just pick, we could just arbitrarily right now, let's just say this is greater than or equal. So zero we'll, we'll consider plus one. I mean, in, in the case, this is just like a toy example just to demonstrate the idea. It's a building block. You know, I don't know how meaningful it is to be able to like classify points in 2D space based on a line in your, but, but so at this point I'm going to make an arbitrary determination for that. Well, if it's on the line, you know, is it, is it above or below? I'll pick one. The other question that was asked is, well, how do you pick these weights? So this is the essential question and this is where I have to get to. So the idea is that what we, through the supervised learning process, we want to search for, we're basically doing a search to find the optimal weights, the optimal weight values that will get the best results, those results with the least amount of errors. And so to start, we have to pick something to start. And in this case, we could pick random values, we could just start with the weights at zero, well, that could be problematic. So there's different ways, this is a big topic in the field of machine learning, when you start a neural network based system, how do you, how do you initialize the weights? randomly, what, what kind of distribution of random numbers, do you do some other kind of like learning process that gets to like a good starting point for the weights? That's a big topic of discussion and research. But for us, I'm going to pick random weights and start to tweak them. Okay, so there's a lot more pieces of this still, but I think I'm going to go and start writing some code and then we'll come back to pieces that we're missing. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do this in, whoops, 
I'm going to do this in processing, which is a Java-based uh, uh, programming language and environment. Um, you can find out more about it at processing.org. I will also release a JavaScript uh, version of this that you can run in the browser. So check this video's description for links to both uh, source codes uh, after it's over. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to create a uh, perceptron class. So what is, it that, what is it that a perceptron needs? A perceptron needs weights. So actually, hold on. I think I have some, yeah. Uh, do I want to look at this? Hold on. All right, let me, hold on. Yeah. I want to create a perceptron class. Um, so we can see here, by the way, I have this slide here. This is the same algorithm I just talked through. Let's just make sure we have it right. The algorithm is for every input, multiply input by the corresponding weight, sum all the weighting it, weighted inputs, and then compute the output based on that sum, pass through, and activation function, the sign of the sum. So we can see, we can think of like, this could be the point at 12 comma four, and these could be the weights of the perceptron. So what I'm gonna do for this particular perceptron is I am going to create an array to store all of those weights. Uh, and I'm gonna say it's an array with two elements in it. And um, in the perceptron constructor, I'm going to loop through all of the weights and give them a random value between negative one and one. So, oh, whoops, you don't say void with a constructor. I don't remember how to program <laughs> in Java-based languages. Okay, so this is the constructor. And what I wanna do in the constructor is initialize the weights randomly. Okay. Now, what are some things the perceptron should do? Well, I, one, of the, one of the things it should do is it should be able to receive inputs and then compute a guess, an output. We'll call that a guess, okay? So let's write a function. I'm gonna call it a guess and it should return an integer, plus one or negative one. Uh, and it should receive inputs, which could also be in the form of an array. Now, I could if I wanted to, be, because of the simplicity of the example, I could have done something like float w0 and float w1. I could just sort of have individual variables for the weights instead of an array. But the nice thing about doing this way is this is more flexible that this, uh, um, we could have, if we reuse this code later, with, well, we could adjust the number of inputs and that sort of things with an array. Okay, so first thing I need to do is compute that weighted sum. So I'm gonna create a variable called sum and initialize it at zero. Then I'm going to loop through all of the weights. And I'm gonna say sum plus equal, what do I wanna do? The sum of all the inputs multiplied by their corresponding weights. So inputs index i times weights index i. So this is now that weighted sum. I say that second step, start with a sum at zero, loop through and multiply all the inputs by the weights. Then what I'm going to do is I am going to return, uh, ah, I need to get the, um, so then I'm gonna say the output is sine of the sum. So it doesn't know what sine is, There's, there probably is a like Java based function I could call automatically, but let's just write our own. Up at the top of this code here, I'm gonna write a function I'm going to say int sign, and it gets, I guess I could say it gets a, any float. Um, and I'm going to say if n is greater than or equal to zero, return a positive one, otherwise return a negative one. So this is just that, this is the, um, so I could, I could write here as a comment, this is the activation function. I could call it activate or something instead. The activation function is a function that receives some value. If it's greater than zero, positive one, if it's less than zero, negative one. So no matter what number goes in to the, whatever inputs come in, whatever that weighted sum is, no matter what, the only thing this perceptron can ever output is a one or a negative one. So, and then I can say return output. So now I have basically, um, if I kind of give myself, nope, 
I really want, I guess this is, I want to see the whole thing. This is, if I, I, I have the, all the code for the, almost all the code for the perceptron. A perceptron has a bunch of weights. It initializes the weights randomly, and it can perform a guess by receiving all the inputs, doing a weighted sum, passing it through the activation function. Okay, so now if I were to just create something arbitrary just to sort of test if this is working, I'm going to say uh, float um, uh, inputs equals, I'm going to just create some random values like negative 1, 0 0.5, and I'm going to say print line. Oh, first I'm going to say I'm going to have a perceptron. I'll just call it P for perceptron. P equals a new, a new perceptron. And then I can say P guess inputs. Uh, and I can say uh, output, I, I can say guess, and I can say, what's wrong here? What doesn't it not like? Oh, oh this should be, uh, sorry, that should, syntax wise, that should, uh, these are the inputs, that's an array. And I should say, um, sorry, uh, print line guess. So if I run this, how come I can't? Here we go. If I run this, we should see, oh, I, I output it a one. Let's run it again. I got a one. Run it again. Eventually, I should be able to run it a bunch of times. And I got a negative one. Negative one. OK, so this, I believe, is working. The system works. I have a perceptron object. I can feed in inputs, and I can um, uh, get, make a guess. Now, here's the, okay. so time out for a second. Um, um, just looking at the chat. Whoops, oh, I broke my bell. <laughs> I just broke my bell. <laughs> I mean, I didn't break it. I can just reattach it. I didn't break it. Uh, Topher J in the chat writes, I believe you can change the color scheme of the processing editor. I, I forget how to do that, but I think in the, in the sort of like deeper preferences, you can change that. Okay. Um, no, no, it's fine. Does it sound different? Yeah, I think. Uh, uh. All right. I'm sorry. I just needed a like little mental break for a second. It's 420. Three, 423. Settle down, everybody. Okay. Um, all right. So let me keep going here. Okay. Okay. So we have the overall structure now for the perceptron, and it works. But we need some, we need to do more. So here's the thing we need to create, now if I had an actual data set, if I were to try to classify flowers, and these were sunflowers, and these were daisies, and this, the x-axis was like petal length, and this was sepal length or something, I could use a real data set here. I'm going to do something really phony baloney. And I think I'm going to like kind of almost be really ridiculous about it, which is that I'm going to say, I'm going to actually just say that anything, do I, do I really want to do this? I'm going to do it this way. Let's do anything that is, I'm going uh, to I'm going to use the line uh, I'm going to use the, a line that goes across the middle, right? So if this is x and this is y, these are all the points where x is greater than y. Oh, I'm so lost. I, I'm trying to think of what's like a really simple thing I could do. Oh, the camera went off. Um, Um, yeah, let's just consider the line y equals x. So anything that's above y equals x, oh, anything that's above y equals x is a plus one. Anything that's below y equals x should be a negative one. So I want to create a known data set 
a known data set that I can use to train the perceptron. So let's do that really quickly. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, let me think about this. I'm going to, there's so many different ways I could do this. Oops, sorry, I got something in my eye. <laughs> can edit that out. Uh, so many different ways I could do this. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a tab called training. And uh, I'm gonna make a class called point. And the point is actually just an input array that has uh, three values in it. No, 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 no. Well, let me think about this. Uh, let me actually have the point have an X and a Y and also a, uh, I don't want to call it class, a label. We'll just call it a label. Um, okay, so if I make a new point, um, when I make a new point, I'm going to say x equals a random width, y equals random height. Am I going to run into trouble without map just using the pixel coordinates? Let's try just using the pixel coordinates. I don't know if that's going to be a problem. Uh, and then the label, I could say uh, if x is greater than y, the label is 1, else the label is negative 1, right? That should give me, uh, <laughs> that should give me everything above. I don't know what's above, what's below. So let's do that. And then let's do, let's write a little function called like show where um, I'm going to say stroke 0 and I'm going to say uh, if label equals 1, uh, fill uh, 255, else fill a zero, and then I'm going to draw a little ellipse at x comma y, uh, a small ellipse, okay? So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to make an array of points. I'm going to make a hundred of them. And uh, I'm going to initialize them. And I'm going to uh, say points index i is a new point. And then I, I, um, let's make the size a little bit bigger, 500 comma 300. Then I'm going to do a background uh, 255 and uh, for every point in points. This is an, an enhanced loop in Java for every point in points. I'm going to say p.show. So if I run this, we can see, uh, yeah, I mean, let's make this a square um, so it looks a little less weird. Um, and I can also draw, just to sort of like see correctly, I'll draw a line from 0, 0 to width, comma, height. So you can see I picked all these points. Half of them are on this side and half of them are on this side. So I'm, I'm reading the chat, which I know I shouldn't do. I shouldn't, I just shouldn't read the chat, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, to, to for the chat points out. The reason why I don't use the for each loop in JavaScript, I guess there's the for in. The for each loop in JavaScript, it's like asynchronous and like weird things can happen. I got to get into that, I know. I got a bit of a, pro I, have, I have some weird quirks that don't make any sense. Okay. All right. Now, what I'm going to do now is I am going to I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Wait. Should be x is greater than or equal to y to be consistent? Should it be? Yeah, probably. That's a good point. Um, hold on, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Can we go to pause for a second? Um, all right, what do I need to do next? I got to get to the learning part. Okay. Okay.
All right, so now that I have all these points and I can see them correctly categorized, this is my known training data. So what I need to do process-wise is I need to take all of my known training data one at a time, I need to pass it in, ask the perceptron to give me a guess. Is it in one, is it in one or is it in negative one? And then I need to do something based on whether it's correct or incorrect. What is it that I need to do? <laughs> okay, let's establish something. Okay, actually, I've, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. What time is it? We've got a problem and then I'm gonna run out of time. It's 4.30. Um, I'm trying to uh, figure out when I want to introduce the fact that I need the bias. Boy, these are hard things to just like completely talk through. All right. Maybe I don't want to talk about the bias just yet. I'll get to that in a little bit. Mm. Maybe I should get to that now. Thinking here. Okay. All right. Um, Okay. Uh, all right, I'm going to keep going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the bias in a little bit. Okay. Uh, there are still some missing pieces here I need to, that, I, that I need to add, but I'm going to keep going. Let's talk about training. Let's talk about supervised learning. Here's what I need to do. I need to take all of that known data. I'm going to take each and every piece of known data, I'm going to take the x and y point and pass it in. It's going to do the weighted sum. It's going to, it's going to pass through the activation function, and it's going to guess plus 1 or negative fun. 1. <laughs> plus fun or negative fun? Are you having, <laughs> we're having some negative fun right now, I'm pretty sure. Um, so this is going to give me a guess. But I also have the answer, right? So I have both the perceptron's guess and I have the answer. If I have both of those things, I can compute something known as the error. The error I can think of as, let's, let's say the answer, I always get this wrong backwards one way or the other, but it's the difference between the correct value and the incorrect, uh, sorry, between the correct value and the guess, right? Because if, it sh if the guess is a plus one, and the answer is a plus one, what's that error? One minus one, that error is zero. And I actually have a little bit of a diagram here to illustrate. This is a pretty simple um, scenario where these are the, oh, I'm in the wrong, sorry. I, I didn't switch the camera. Um, I have a diagram over here where uh, you, know, you can sort of see, these are the only possible correct answers, negative one or plus one. So there's only four possibilities. If it's supposed to be a negative one, I could guess a negative one or a plus one. If it's supposed to be a plus one, I could guess a negative one or a plus one. So these are all the possible errors. The error is either zero or the error is negative two or positive two or zero. So this is a, st this is a good starting point. I need to have this error. The idea here, oh, come back. Let me come back to the whiteboard. OK. So remember, what I'm trying to do is find the optimal weights. So ultimately, what I want to do is I want to figure out if I want to say, well, the weight should equal itself plus some change in weight. I want to adjust the weight. If there's a mistake, I want to make a tweak. I want to like make the weight a little bit higher or a little bit lower, right? Because maybe my weighted sum got me below negative one, but it should be a plus one. If I make that weight higher, maybe that'll push the output up to positive. So the issue becomes, how do I calculate that delta weight? How should this weight change? 
based on um, how, how should the weight change for weight zero, for weight one, and if there were many, many, many more weights. So the way that this is calculated with a, is with a process called gradient descent. And I have a couple videos where I go through this in, in pretty large detail. Um, one way of thinking about this, which I'll, I'll kind of duplicate here in this video, is this really relates back to a lot of my steering examples. So I have all these steering examples where I have a vehicle that has a given velocity and it's seeking a given target. So this vehicle has a velocity and it also has a desired velocity, right? Because if it should be going towards that target, its desired velocity is to go towards that target. So you can think of this steering formula, if you go back to that Craig Reynolds steering formula, the steering formula equals the difference between the desired velocity, the way that I want to go, and the current velocity, which is kind of like my guess. And if I get this steering formula, if I get this steering function, if I get this steering vector and I add it to the velocity, it's going to cause me to turn and go towards that target. So essentially, that's what I want to do here. This steering vector is the error. The desired velocity is the answer. That's where I want to go. The velocity is my guess. That's where I'm going right now. I want to steer in the direction of the error. So delta weight, the delta weight is actually equal to the error multiplied by the input. So it's filtered through the input. What's that error filtered through the input? That's how I change the weight itself. So that's the process that I'm going to do over and over again. And I have uh, a slide here that I think will walk through that in a, oops, I'm in the wrong keyboard uh, here. So this is the process. This is the supervised learning algorithm. Provide the perceptron with inputs for which there is a known answer and ask the perceptron to guess. Okay, the perceptron guessed. What's the error? Is it right or wrong? Is the error zero? Is it two? Is it negative two? Adjust the weights according to the error and go back and do it again and again and again. Um, and this is the formula. The weight is changed according to the error multiplied by the input. And there's something called learning rate, which I'll get to in a second. So let's see, now I've kind of explained that in pieces. Let me see if I can now add that to the code. So I'm going to here, whoops. Um, I'm going to, um, now create a function in the perceptron and I'm not going to call it guess, I'm going to call it uh, train. So this is going to receive some inputs and a target. Right? The difference between a guess is a guess is something like, oh, I just want to receive these inputs and provide a guess. With training, I want to receive the inputs and the known answer so I can adjust the weights accordingly. Okay, so the first thing actually that I should do is just get the guess, which is actually guess with those inputs. So since I already have a function that does the guess, I can ask for the guess from that guess. Then what I want to do is get the error. The error equals, um, the error equals the target minus the guess. That's the error. So now that I've done that, what I can do is I can go through all of the weights and say each weight should change according to that error multiplied by its corresponding input. So this is that particular algorithm. This is tune all the weights. Okay? So this is like basically supervised learning says put the data in, get the result. If the result is right, just move on, move along, nothing to see here. If the result is wrong, twist some dials in here to try to get it closer to the correct answer and do it again and again and over and over again. You keep twisting dials eventually to find that optimal result. Now, there's something important here though. If I go back to this steering example, you could think about, okay, so this is the vehicle, it's going in this direction, it should seek the target. It knows what the error is. The error is the difference between the way it should go and its current velocity. How much should it steer? If I steer a lot, I could actually like overshoot and start going the wrong way in the other direction. But if I steer just a little bit, 
Maybe I'm going closer, but I'm, uh, but, and, and you realize that we're gonna be doing this with lots and lots of data. So one thing that's actually optimal here is not to steer the full amount all the way according to the error, but just some percentage of the way. And that percentage is referred to, it's a key concept here, and it's called, uh, where's a uh, learning rate? So what I would actually do here is say that delta weight, what's this plus one here? Is the error times the input, or, uh, multiplied also by a learning rate. So that's a key concept here. So let's add that into our code. If I come back over here, I'm gonna, the perceptron is going to have a variable, call it LR for learning rate. I'm just going to say 0 0.1. So now I'm going to say also multiplied by learning rate. So there we go. Now this is going to adjust all of the weights. So we should be able to if I go back to here, I should be able to now train the perceptron. So let's go here and say for all of the points. Oh, I did something terrible. Oh, I'm doing some awful stuff here, which is that I used P for perceptron, and then I'm using a local variable P for points. So let's call this uh, PT for point. Let's actually just call this, I'm going to call perceptron, I'm going to call this like the brain. It's probably like a bad variable name, but at least it's a, it says something more than P. So for every point, what I want to do is I want to say uh, brain.train the point, the inputs associated with that point and the target pass in the target associated with that point, right? The point, oh, it has an X and a Y and a label. Ah, so, uh, <laughs> so the target is actually the label. And can I do this? I want to make something called inputs, which is an array, which just has point.x and point.y in it. Is, is Java going to let me write that? I think so. So this is what I want to do. I want to train the perceptron. I want to send in every point as inputs. So x, the x and the y make the 0 and the 1 input. And then I want to send it into the train function with the label, which is the known answer. So if I do that, OK, so in theory, it's training and it's doing this. I can't see anything. So now I need some sort of way of tracking how well it's doing. This is going to be tricky, but I, I have an idea for how to do this. So I think what I want to do, pause, edit for a second. I have to sneeze. Hitchu! <laughs> Somebody in the chat just pointed out that you know, why am I doing the, um, why am I doing the same loop twice? Yeah, that's kind of unnecessary here, but I'm, I'm really just trying to separate out different parts of the code. Um, ultimately, I probably don't need this original loop. But, um, so there's a couple things I do. One is I could actually calculate the overall error. Like I could actually look, and this wouldn't be such a bad idea and just sort of print that out. I could, I could um, calculate the total squared error and kind of evaluate how well it's doing. But I want to just actually look at it visually for a second. So I think what I want to do is, um, let me see here, what's a good way? So I'm going to just actually say guess equals uh, inputs, uh, brain.guess inputs. And then I'm going to say if guess equals uh, point.label, let's just call this, let's say target equals points, points uh, label just to have these in separate variables. If guess equals target, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to draw something that's green. I'm going to say uh, no stroke. I'm going to draw an ellipse at uh, x. <laughs> I just keep typing p5. Uh, y, that's like a smaller size. Um, else 
fill a red. Well, everything became green instantly. That can't be right. All right, let's not train it. Okay. So we can see, I, I guess it's just working better than I had imagined. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think visually if there's a better, this is like, okay. So um, let, me, let me make the window bigger and let me make all of the points, um, let me make all the points um, much bigger so it's a little easier to see. And uh, let's run this again. Um, okay, so you can see without any training, uh, everything is wrong. So I'm not, if I add the train function back in, everything is correct. Now, I guess it just like, this is such a simple scenario that it like trained and worked so, so, so quickly in like a matter of like one or two iterations. Um, so I, I think you could probably, if you're watching this, be a bit more clever in terms of how you, um, uh, how you visualize this. And I'm gonna say a few more things about this. Okay, so I'm coming towards the end of this uh, particular video and I think I need to do, I'm gonna give you some exercises and I think I'm gonna do a follow-up one that um, kind of adds, I'm gonna give you some exercises and then I'm gonna come back and do another video where I add this, these answers in. But so there's a couple things here. One is I've got a serious problem, a very serious problem with everything that I've done here. Let's just say, I'm gonna, um, let's say that the space that I'm in is actually this. Zero, zero, forget about pixel space or anything. There's a coordinate space where zero, zero is in the middle, right here, and I want to categorize the, uh, data as above or below this line. Or maybe, uh, you know, I want to use the same system, but I want to categorize data as above or below this other line. So I want to use a perceptron to categorize, the same exact code to categorize both of these two scenarios. Well, in one case, in the orange case, 0, 0 should be a plus 1. In the black case, 0, 0 should be a negative 1. But notice something here. If I'm actually feeding in 0, 0 into this perceptron system, no matter what the weights are, the only thing I can ever get out of here is a 0. This is a problem <laughs> because Sometimes zero, zero is going to be above or below. Sometimes it's going to be in class A, sometimes it's going to be in class B. That can't possibly be right. And this is where this idea of a third, I'm going to go and get another color here. This perceptron will actually not work or perform correctly with this gene generic scenario other than with having uh, something called a bias. So I need another input, a third input, into the perceptron that is always going to be a 1. Input 0 is x, input 1 is y, and the bias is 1. And actually, if you think about this, this is really, I'm really working through the same problem that's from my linear regression with gradient descent videos, where what I'm trying to do is solve the fu formula, I'm trying, you know, neural networks are designed to generalize a fu to function, to solve a function. And in this case, this very simplistic scenario is actually just looking to solve the formula for this line, y equals mx plus b. And m being the slope is kind of like rise over run, and b being the y-intercept. So this weight, the bias weight is really there to solve that y-intercept. And these weights are really solving the slope, the rise over run. So that's what we're doing. We're essentially doing linear regression with gradient descent again, but just through this perceptron model. 
so if you didn't watch those other videos, you could go back and watch them to sort of connect all these systems. So um, what I want you to do, and edit point here for a second, um, I'm just going to uh, have this open. is uh, I have an example here uh, from the Nature of Code book. This is essentially the same code that I've been writing, but it does two different things. One is it uh, visualizes what the brain thinks the current line is, and also it adds that bias. So if you're watching this video, I'm gonna release the code for this video. This, I guess, is part one of the Perceptron Coding Challenge. If you're watching this video, you could just go right to the next one and I'm gonna add the bias in and maybe do a bit more with sort of visualizing what's going on here and have a generic formula for a line. Um, um, but uh, what I might suggest you do is see if you can add those things yourself to this particular perceptron. And then when I get to the end of the next video, I'm gonna talk about why this is such a limited system that can barely actually do anything meaningful in machine learning. <laughs> um, but it can be a building block for a much more complex system that can do a lot more interesting and powerful things. So I hope you got a sense of what a perceptron is, what the algorithm for how a perceptron works is, and how the feed forward supervised learning training process of a model of a perceptron works. Because this exact building block, this scenario, is what I'm going to use in a, the future videos where we start to build more complex neural networks. Okay, thanks for watching, and I look forward to your feedback and thoughts in the comments. Um, okay, I am going to, uh, so, so I have to kind of like cut that short a little bit because I have to go in about five minutes. <laughs> and you know, I sort of felt like that video was getting a little bit long anyway. So um, I hopefully that was like, I feel like there's some missing pieces here. I'm gonna come back next week and finish that off. Um, it, do, does anyone have any questions or corrections or things you wanna mention? Um, I would love to uh, hear them. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to getting out of this machine learning stuff, but I, I'm, I, hopefully I'm doing an okay job. Um, I'm kind of amazed that this worked. Uh, and um, oh yeah, uh, oh um, me, I am so me. You said uh, try training on mouse click. I see what you mean. So like run the training once. That's a very good. So yeah. So hold on. Let me try that. I like this idea. So I'm going to put all of this here. I should have done this in the video. And I'm going to say void a mouse pressed. This should just be doing the training. Uh, but I still need to do this. So this should be, right now if I do this, this is its guess. for everything, and then if I click train, train, train. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, can I go back? Do you think we can insert this, Mathieu, into the middle somewhere? That's a really, that was such a good suggestion. I'm gonna try. This might be impossible to do, but that was so useful. So, okay. I'm just gonna record this and if this could get inserted in, that'll be wonderful, but I don't know if that'll work. And I, I really gotta go soon. Okay. Um, me, I am so me in the chat had an excellent suggestion where maybe what I should do is actually, ugh, oh, fail. Uh, me, I am so me in the chat had an excellent suggestion which I could demonstrate the training process with a mouse click. So I'm going to quickly do that. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take this uh, training out here. I'm going to take this whole loop and del just delete this line of code that actually does the training. And I'm going to run it. So now it's not training and you can see it's got, every time, it, you know, when I run this, 
It's all wrong, <laughs> right? But what I can do now is I can say void uh, mouse pressed, and I can just run the training algorithm. So now what I did is only when I click the mouse is it going to run through all the data and actually adjust the weights. So now if I run this, you can see, you can see look at this. It's got most wrong, but uh, it's got some right. It's got most right, but some wrong. And now if I click the mouse, ah, a few more are correct, but some more are wrong. Click the mouse again. Oop, click the mouse again. Click the mouse again. Click the mouse again. So you can see it's like changing, and eventually now it's got everything right. Uh, and so you can see how that learning process happens over time. It only took five or six cycles. And maybe this will get, that'll be the end. It'll get spliced in somehow. So I, you know, there's, I think there's a lot more creative ways you could visualize the training. You could also visualize the perceptron itself, and we could visualize the weights. Um, I guess I'm going to come back to this uh, in the, that will only make it take a while. It's not animating while it learns. He needs to only train a few points at a time. Oh, yeah, I could also just train with one point at a time. <laughs> oh, I want to add that in. Um, hmm, so many good suggestions. Um, uh, there also, I can't see who that was in the YouTube chat. Uh, one other thing that I could do is just train one point at a time. So I'm going to draw everything, but I could here, I could say, um, I could say int training index equals zero. So what I'm going to do in draw now is I'm going to say uh, point training equals points training index. So I'm just going to take one point and train it off that one point. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say training index plus plus, and if training uh, training index equals points dot length, like if I get to the end of the array, I will just reset training index back equal to zero. So this now in the draw loop, what did I get wrong here? I'm just spelling training wrong. Oh, d double equals, sorry. So now in the draw loop, it should be training one point at a time. And you can see like it's kind of weird, all sorts of weird flashy stuff is happening. But over time, it should eventually settle into at getting everything correct. But as it makes these little adjustments, it's going to get some things wrong and some things right. And you can see now. So again, there's so many other ways you could think about visualizing the training. And you could actually visualize, you know, one thing you might try is actually visualize the perceptron itself. Like visualize the weights, visualize the connection, visualize the data flowing through it. So I'll leave that to you, creative people watching this video. OK. <laughs> So that I've really made a, the most complicated editing puzzle ever here. I've got to go. I am going to take, uh, I'm going to play my goodbye song. Um, I'll see if, I, if there's a one or two questions in the chat. Thank you guys for, um, thank you guys for tolerating this uh, journey into like some of these esoteric and very highly technical and not so practical. Make a line object. Uh, Simon Tiger uh, mentions as well. That's a great idea. So I'm going to leave the more creative ways of doing this stuff uh, to uh, to you guys, to to all of you watching. Um, uh, I've got to run. I'm going to be back next Friday. Unfortunately, I, I want to be able to try to do additional live streams, get further along, also take breaks from the machine learning stuff, and do some other creative coding challenges. Challenges, but um, uh, so hopefully I'll. Uh, Another week I'll be able to do that, but I, I, I'm almost sure I won't be back till next Friday. So next Friday, um, maybe I'll try to start getting into the neural network stuff. Maybe I'll just take a break and do some other game coding challenge. We will see. I'm going to see if there's any questions in the chat that I can answer. Somebody posted volcano emoji, which I don't know what that means. Oof. What's the next episode? I don't know, to be determined. I'm not feeling super um, need a perceptron to calculate the optimal edit points. That's a great suggestion. I'm not feeling, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm definitely like questioning you know, everything I've ever done in my entire life up until now, wondering if anything I'm doing is good or useful or helpful. Um, but um, 
doing them. The salsa music's name. The salsa music, I don't know if that's really salsa music. That music kind of that I was playing is by um, Adam Blau, who is a film and television composer based in LA, who is actually working on a new Coding Train theme song that will be coming out soon. I'm sorry, Shoe Doctor. This uh, archive will be available as soon as I hit stop on the live stream. You can go back and watch the whole thing. Uh, I've got to be uh, got to be somewhere by six o'clock, and it's going to take me some time to unplug everything and do everything and get get out of here. So, um, uh, so um, thank you all again. <laughs> do I look? I don't think I look frazzled enough. I, I don't. I, I should go over here, and you get this. Oops. This is. This is how I feel right now. <laughs> you could screenshot that or GIF it or whatever. I, I'm, I, I'm a little, it's a little bit weird how obsessed I am with the vanity of people making uh, GIFs, but um, where am I going? I have to pick up my daughter from a play date. <laughs> so uh, that's where I'm going. Uh, um, so thanks, thanks. Oh, the song's over. I've got to go. I'll be back next week. Please send me your questions and comments and feedback in, uh, in uh, comments in, on Twitter at Schiffman. I appreciate it. If you can encourage, if you can subscribe and like and all that stuff and watch and encourage other people to watch, all that stuff helps me out. The more people find the channel, the more watch time I have, all that stuff helps. So spread the word. Uh, if you like the stuff, if you don't, please don't feel, don't feel any need to, of course. <laughs> Only genuine. Whatever. Hey, I've really got to go. Thank you, guys. Um, and... I should get one of Siraj's videos and go slowly over it step by step. That's a good idea. Okay, so I will um, see you guys later. Goodbye.